Hello. I'm delighted to be joined by Professor Richard Suskind, one of the world's leading experts on AI and its effect upon the legal profession. Richard, AI is a much used term, sometimes misused, sometimes there's too much hyperbole, sometimes there's too much negativity. But ultimately, what does it mean to you? I think there's two ways of looking at AI. I say you can define it functionally or architecturally, if you'll forgive the phrases. Architecturally is in terms of the, the flavours of the month, technologically speaking. So when I was involved in the 80s in developing systems, we used logic programming and rule-based systems. Today you hear people talking about machine learning and neural networks. Mm -hmm. All of that is technically interesting, but I think rather beside the point, I think the, the bigger issue is functionally what do these systems do. And one way of looking at it is that these systems are performing tasks that in the past we have thought required thinking human beings, intelligent human beings. What I quite strongly want to deny is that any of these current systems are actually thinking or have cognitive states. They're not conscious, they're no more conscious than the mm -hmm. carpet before us here. Okay. These are systems that interestingly are non-thinking machines but very high performing. And so they're performing tasks and increasingly taking on tasks that we thought in the past could only be performed by human beings and human lawyers in particular. Now, can I just make the observation that I do think there's a huge amount of hype, rather unhelpful hype just now, an exaggeration about the short-term impact of AI. But in the long term, I think we're understating the, the, the actual impact. So there's a strange imbalance. People are getting all excited about what might happen over the next 18 months, much of which, frankly, is exaggeration. But if you look deep into the 20s, I think a great deal of what goes on in the law office will be done by systems or machines. As a consequence of the reporting that hype and hyperbole it may be, uh, two human emotions are provoked. One is hope amongst those who like the idea of AI and welcome it and embrace it, and the other is fear for people who fear that they will lose their jobs at some point in the future and be s supplanted by a machine instead. Uh, what's your view about those two emotions and how people emo respond to the I think it reflects people's reaction to technology generally. Some people get excited and some people feel threatened by it. Some people see opportunity, others see threat. If you look in the 20s, which is my time frame, because as we move into the 30s and 40s, it's very hard to predict. We'll be dominated then by yeah. as yet uninvented technologies. But if you look at the 20s, I don't take the view that that'll be the decade of unemployment. The phrase I use, it'll be the decade of redeployment. And by this I mean, and it's a huge challenge, we'll find many people in legal businesses retooling, retraining and developing systems that are replacing the old ways of working. So what I say is the big challenge strategically and for our careers is either to compete with these systems or build the systems. By competing with the systems I'm saying, and many people will say, uh, I hear all this talk about AI, but there's still much that human lawyers can do that machines will never do, and that's what I want to do for my career and my business. And others will say, on any view, the amount that only human beings can do is probably shrinking. So the real opportunity, and this is the opportunity, is actually to be involved in building these systems. There's a little bit of a mantra of mine now, we're building the systems that replace us. Yes. We're building the systems that replace traditional ways of working. But to do that uh, will require, not just technologists, will require lawyers redefined. It will require legal knowledge engineers, legal risk managers, legal process analysts, and I argue they're tomorrow's lawyers. Now, redeployment already happens in law firms uh, in terms of the economic cycle. Different areas are busier at different times. So when there's a, a relative boom in the economy, there are more corporate lawyers, more M&A lawyers, and conversely, when there's a recession, there are more insolvency lawyers, and they, they change the label, but they're still lawyers. Uh, the skill set remains the same. What you're alluding to there is a different skill set. The, the older you are, the more difficult it is to acquire, and the more complex and challenging it is to be redeployed uh, in, into a different role for which you haven't trained and haven't um, No one says it's not a major challenge. Yeah. Think of self-driving cars and autonomous vehicles though. I, it seems to me with all the will in the world the likelihood of many truck drivers retraining as software engineers is minimal. The likelihood of lawyers training uh, retraining as legal knowledge engineers is greater. So let me give you an example. If you think of document automation and the idea mm. that increasingly people will have documents drafted not by instructing a lawyer but by answering a series of questions on screen and it will come off polished first draft. Frankly that technology has been around for over 30 years. If you think of that technology, it's not a technological task to develop that system, mm -hmm. it, it, it's actually a task of knowledge engineering. Someone has to look at the relevant law, has to craft the many potentially applicable paragraphs, they have to identify the logic through 
the potential documents, every permutation thought through. That for me is a job for lawyers. It's a job for tomorrow's lawyers. And I often say to young students coming through uh, who are graduating, they say, well, that's not what I'm training to do. I train to draft. And I say, well, actually, surely you train to solve the problems that your clients come to you with. And if they come with a problem, for example, they a major company might say we've got 20,000 new employees every year and we'd like a system to generate employment contracts driven by our HR department. I don't think the law should say that's not what we envisaged at a law school and so we're not up for that. I think there's the great opportunity. And being a knowledge engineer is a legal task and it's a new job for lawyers. And you're right though, it's um, a redeployment that's quite different in skill and ambition from slipping from being a corporate lawyer to being an insolvency law. And not to minimise that jump, but we're talking about something that requires fundamental retraining. But isn't it interesting that um, if you look at uh, other professions, a uh, company like Accenture, for example, uh, they told me in research for one of my books that uh, within a very small number of years, their field of digital marketing, they went from zero to 15% of their fee income in that area. This is a business now of over 400,000 people. It seems in other industries we managed to diversify. Uh, when I was, uh, my first job was with Ernst & Winnie, it became Ernst & Young. They used the phrase uh, at that stage in the mid 80s, we don't just help you add up, we also help you multiply. And I thought it was a wonderful way of capturing the move from being an accounting firm to being yes. a consulting firm. So why not in law as well? Uh, what is holding us back? I look at the major accounting firms and how they have an appetite mid-career for people to take what they've learned in terms of their interpersonal skills, their business know-how and so forth, but have a hunger for actually taking on board new skills. That's going to be the characteristic, I think, of, of uh, our children, uh, that they won't go through one career, they'll go through many careers continually refining and retraining. I suppose the difficulty for people, say, in their 30s through their 50s just now is that's really not how we've been wired to think. And psychologically, many people, I often joke, say, I hope I can hold out to retirement before I need to do this. On the other hand, as I always say too, what a great privilege to be alive at a time where we're redefining the way that we gain access to justice. We're redefining the way we can advise businesses on their regulatory and legal obligations. Nevertheless, it, the 2020s are only just a little over two years away. Yeah, I, I have uh, very close uh, that. Yeah, I, I, and uh, those doing law degrees, those at law schools, those who are trainee solicitors, the typical six, sometimes seven year route into law. Um, at no stage in most of those is there any technology training, um, and yet those are going to be the young lawyers of the mid-2020s. So whose responsibility is it going to be? Is it going to be the law firms, or do they need to be autodidacts, or does there need to be external training, continuous training? How's it going to work? Well, you put your finger on what is probably my gravest concern about the future of the legal profession, and that's our law schools. I've been quite vocal about this, and of course the law professors don't like what I'm saying, but the reality is we're generating 20th century lawyers and we're, how we teach and what we teach hasn't much changed mm -hmm. since I studied law in the 70s and 80s. I'm a law professor as well, so I, I see this in action. Now, if it has been true, and it has been true for many years, that, for example, major city firms say that when they're, even the best graduates come in, they really don't know much about practicing law. If that was true over the last 10 or 15 years, it's even more true now, because we're asking for an entirely different skill set to the next decade or so. And what genuinely upsets me in my travels, there is and in my last count, 19 law schools in the United States where they have either teaching programs in legal technologies, indeed centre for research in, in legal technology. In England, we don't have a single one. And this does disturb me. And some of the great universities that I speak to, when I speak to the deans, I can't come near to... I can't come near to persuading them. So we've got a lot of work to do now. Is, is that a generational factor because they're men and women in their 50s and 60s and therefore they're sufficiently removed from understanding the future on our doorstep? There's an element of that. It's also what I was talking about at the conference, which is the innovator's dilemma. I was saying that for very successful law firms, their big question is, do we really need to change yet? Why? We don't want to. We're on a winning streak. Um, <laughs> and many of the successful law schools think the same. They've trot taught and constitutional law jurisprudence very successfully for many years and they're thinking we're getting the best students, they're getting great results, so do we really want to, to stop this winning streak? And of course I think all of these subjects are very important. My answer that I put forward in my book Tomorrow's Lawyers is that our law schools should be providing options. Yeah. Options, for example, in new skills that I refer to, like knowledge engineering or legal process uh, analysis. I think there should also be, s there's a discipline now emerging, mm. the, uh, the future of, of law, the uh, mm. future mm. of legal studies. and my experience from looking at this in the States is if you make these courses available, at least 
as options, you'll find that so many students want to take, students are investing in their own careers, and this is, I think, the, 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 the gravest charge I put at the law schools. We have students taking out phenomenal loans to be prepared to be lawyers, and the education they're receiving, it seems to me, is not fit for purpose. That's not to say the traditional legal education is not sound, it's just not extensive enough. It's not reflecting this world that I and others see. Now, a few years ago, I was still on the edge and people were saying, you know, that's just good talking about all this future of law nonsense, but it's pretty mainstream thinking now. You're not going to go to see one of the top 30 firms in, in London and hear them saying that legal practice isn't changing. Everyone's got an innovation group. Everyone's talking about AI. Now, to some extent, it's, it's still, we're still at the foothills, but in the law schools, we're not even scraping, scraping the surface. So one of my ambitions is actually, is to shake the law schools up a bit. He was talking more generally about AI when he said this, but you'll be aware of what Elon Musk had, mm -hmm. has, had to say about regulation, lack of regulation, and the concern that AI could go mad, in a sense, without control and regulation. Uh, he wasn't talking specifically about law firms. Nevertheless, there is a, an issue in terms of regulation. There is no AI law mm. yet specifically. Do you see that emerging as a body of law? And if so, do you see a, a tier of regulation above it, which will require both law firms and other us others using AI uh, to have in place safety checks within the systems that they're using to ensure that things don't go catastrophically wrong. Well, uh, there's so many questions uh, embedded in your set of observations there. I've written a submission to the House of Lords Select Committee on Artificial Intelligence which identifies some of the big policy challenges yes. because it's not just one set of laws. I mean, it, 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 it goes to the heart of our educational system. Certainly a, a wide range of regulatory and liability issues arise in terms of the competitive positioning of UK mm -hmm. industry. We've got a whole set of of questions there. Musk's theme is that we might have created a monster here. Um, Marvin Minsky, who was one of the founding fathers of artificial intelligence, once said, the next generation of machines will be so intelligent, we'll be lucky if they keep us around as household pets. And we used to chortle at that. And it's true still today that a lot of the so-called AI systems are still quite narrow. That's to say they operate, for example, in law and very, they work at a very high level, but they're their domains of application are quite limited. We haven't got to the stage of what's known as AGI, which is artificial general intelligence, where systems perhaps evolving like young children, although very rapidly learn from the environment and can perform general knowledge tasks, as it were. The fear that Musk has, and Bill Gates has articulated the same one, and Steve Hawking has too, is that these systems, in the language that my son and I use, are becoming increasingly capable, and there's no obvious end to this and there's no sense in which the pace of change is plateauing in fact the pace of change seems to be accelerating and so they're saying and i don't think it's outrageous at all uh, there is a serious chance here that we're developing systems that could outperform us and over which we wouldn't have any significant control in the long run i don't think so for the next five or ten years but one thinks of 100 or 200 years from now when you think of the the, the progress we've made over the last couple of years in, say, self-driving cars. And so I think that certainly uh, in businesses and governments, if you see a potential existential threat, maybe 10, 15, 20 percent, you take that seriously. And I think that's what they're basically saying. There's been some histrionic renditions of what they've had to say, but they're saying we're developing systems. And if you think of uh, autonomous weaponry, you see a very acute illustration of this, that we should be thinking through their implications before the runaway systems. And that seems entirely sensible to me. Our difficulty, of course, is that our, our regulators and our legislators in technology generally usually lag behind some years and we really need to be far more nimble. So going back to one of your earlier themes, you can see here both a phenomenal opportunity for technologies taking on some tasks that human beings perhaps couldn't perform. We can also see some great potential threats as well. Your advice to young lawyers, if the law firms that they work for are not uh, equipping them with the right skill set, the law schools and the uh, training that they receive generally, should they take it upon themselves as realists rather than optimists or pessimists, being pragmatic, that they need to have that skill set as part of their future army, armory to develop their career? Insofar as you're a great student in, uh, credentially and you have the option of choosing amongst firms, obviously I'd be saying go for one of the, the firms that seems to be leading the way here. For the rest, you really answered my question. I think it is time for self-help. So actually, in closing my book, 
uh, Tomorrow's Lawyers first and second edition, I make that kind of point. I say to some extent you're on your own, folks. You're not really going to be taking a lead. There's still not that many leaders in the legal industry who are deeply mm. knowledgeable. I think there's a strong sense in us leaders in law firms and in house council and the judiciary and government that some very where the threshold of some very major changes. But interestingly, this is an area where I think tomorrow's legal system, tomorrow's justice system will be designed by those who are leaving law school just now. Can you compare the medicine to law in any way with reference to AI? It is interesting to look at uh, the professions. I often say to people who are thinking perhaps of becoming doctors, don't go into medicine if you want to practice medicine like your aunt or your next door neighbour. Go into medicine because you're interested in improving people's health. And I don't see why we can't apply that same sort of thinking into law. They don't go into law because you've seen the way your uncle practiced or perhaps the way your careers advisor said law was being practiced. Go into law because you're interested in improving access to justice or you're interested in advising companies better than in the past and how to manage their legal and regulatory affairs. It's, it is interesting, I think, with uh, law students. I often say um, you shouldn't really be studying law if you're attracted by or you think it's going to be like Rumpel or Suits or The Good Wife, um, all of which I enjoy. Uh, but that's 20th century lawing. 21st century lawyering is going to be a very different beast. Richard, thank you very much indeed.